Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Radical Candor podcast. I'm Kim Scott, co-founder of Radical Candor and author of Radical Candor and Just Work. And I'm Amy Sandler, your host for the Radical Candor podcast. Jason is not joining us today. We miss you, Jason. And in your absence, we're going to talk about a topic that I confess I don't know a ton about, Kim, so I am excited to learn more. And so for those of you like me who don't know a whole lot about performance improvement plans or have tried to put your head in the sand about performance improvement plans, this is a podcast for you, otherwise known as PIPs. And so as someone who has been told she pops her peas on podcast, the use of the word PIPs might present possibly some presenting problems, but we will do our best. Thank you, producer. That was very good. Oh. That was very good, Amy. We're going to have pop- no PIP problems nope. today. <laughs> I will not be placed on a PIP for my no, peas. No, you will not be placed Whew. on a PIP for your peas. Oh, maybe for something else. All right. We received- or for anything else. Oh, thank you. For- <laughs> thank you. We received an email from someone who wanted to let us know that a friend of theirs was put on a performance improvement plan after only working for their manager for four weeks. And this person's boss told them they were practicing radical candor. Kim, in radical candor, you said, quote, or some version of a quote, I'll extrapolate, everyone can be exceptional somewhere and it's a boss's job to help them find that role. It's also a boss's job to strive to have 100% of the team doing exceptional work. So in that context, four weeks seems pretty quick to place someone on a PIP and call it radical candor. Do you agree with that? And, And we should probably get into defining what a PIP is and what would make it a radically candid practice or not. Do you want us to start with the definition or do you want to have a just a blink reaction on four weeks for a PIP? So I think a couple of things. Uh, before we, before all of those are important questions, but something else is coming to mind. Some other more fundamental issue is coming to mind for me, which is that radical candor. When we talk about these basic two-minute impromptu radical candor conversations, we're really talking about development conversations where you're helping someone improve. We're not talking about performance management. Once you get to a performance improvement plan, you're talking about performance management. And I think that very often that seems like a nuanced thing, but it's really important and fundamental. Like mostly when when you're having these impromptu two-minute radical candor conversations, you're not judging the person. You're not, there's no impact on their pay, their bonus, whether they're going to get fired. You're just, you're, you're playing the role of a coach. This is the player and I'm trying to help this player get better. And so I think that it's really important to remember that. Having said that, that doesn't mean that performance management is unimportant. So how do performance management and these development conversations go together? If you're having a lot of impromptu two-minute radical candor talks, it makes performance management go much more easily. Uh, and by performance management, what, in addition to a PIP, what is included in performance management? What is included there is sort of a 360 degree um, process where you're getting feedback from your manager, but also your peers and your employees, you know, 360, obviously from people up, down and sideways. Uh, what is included in that are our bonus plans, if ratings, if your company has them, and then and then ultimately uh, a performance improvement plan. So in my mind, anyway, a performance Im- improvement plan usually happens after much longer than four weeks. Four weeks seems fast. However, and in this case, in the case that this person was writing in about, it was way too fast. So it was a big problem. It was not radical candor. It was total bullshit. And uh, uh, that's a technical term. Um, so there's my blink reaction. Uh, so what do you think about that, Amy? And then I'll answer your other questions. Yeah, well, <laughs> Sorry. I, no, I think it's great because we do get versions of this question and potential conflation between performance management and development 
conversations. And so I'm, I'm curious, Kim, if somebody is having a, like if we're having one of these one or two minute conversations and you say, Amy, in the podcast, I've noticed that you take a lot of time when you're asking these questions. And I think it would be more helpful if you could be more succinct and get more quickly to the point. Is that not a, like related to my performance on how I could do better? Yes, but it's it's about developing your performance. It's not about it's not about managing you out. It's not about the, you know. If I said, Amy, your bonus this quarter is going to be dependent. If we had bonuses, quarterly bonuses, but your bonus. <laughs> I wish like, you wait, had a bonus. Oh, this is great. <laughs> Announcing on the podcast. She said it here, folks, on the podcast. We're moving into quarterly bonuses. Jason's decisions. Yeah. And well, Jason's, Jason's not, not here. here. So. <laughs> I, I am a, I am a kick-ass co-founder. Jason, guess what Kim said? A- We're giving quarterly bonuses. <laughs> anyway, if I said your quarterly bonus is going to be dependent on your on whether or not you can ask questions more quickly, then that would be performance management, not a development conversation. Anytime there's sort of an extrinsic uh, situation going on, like a rating or a bonus or, or, or getting promoted or getting fired, now we're talking about performance management. What I'm talking about in these impromptu conversations is just developing the person, d- giving the person advice. Whatever words you want to use, there's some stuff that has to do with sort of extrinsic pay, hiring, firing, promoting, and then there's stuff that has to do with intrinsic, I want to get better at my job. And so the I want to get better at my job stuff is what I call performance development or just development. And performance management is how I tend to refer to all of that extrinsic money, promotion, hiring, firing stuff. Does that make sense as a distinction? It does. I think what's on my mind, especially by the time somebody might get to a performance improvement plan, first of all, just to define what it is. So from the Society for Human Resource Management or SHRM, quote, a performance improvement plan, PIP, also known as a performance action plan, is a tool used to give an employee with performance deficiencies the opportunity to succeed. It is used to address failures to meet specific job goals or behavior-related concerns, end quote. So I guess before I move on for my question, the kind of follow-up question, do you agree with that definition? Do you want to flesh that out further, Kim? Yeah, that is what it ought to be. That is what a performance improvement plan ought to be. And The problem, I think, when people hear the term performance improvement plan, how that's what how they are often used as opposed to how they ought to be used are two different things. How a performance improvement plan is often used, and this is what that definition from um, the SHRM is is trying to prevent. But how they are often used is, let's say, there's a manager who has not given feedback to their employee. And in fact, they've even given their employees excellent ratings. And then all of a sudden, they decide they want to fire that employee, having not given the feedback, mm-hmm. having not given the ratings, uh, um, having not given an, import, uh, uh, an official performance review. And, uh, and so they write this performance improvement plan in such a way that it is impossible to, to fulfill. (laughs) And so the person, they write it in such a way that incentivizes the person to just quit rather it's, it's Mm -hmm. a way of managing someone out as opposed to helping them improve. It's supposed to help them improve. It's supposed to make sure that the manager has been clear with the person about what the problem mm-hmm. is. And so in an ideal world, which this is not, uh, the, the, the way a performance improvement plan should be used is, let's say I have someone working for me and they're late all the time. And I've given them feedback. I've given them feedback, sort of regular, these are a bunch of two-minute impromptu conversations. The situation is not improving. improving. I 
I give them a performance review and a low rating, and I say the problem is. So now we're we've moved from development to that feedback that you are giving them about their being late in these one or two minute conversations. Like that really is that's development. Like at first, the first nobody's well. Hopefully, nobody's going to get fired for being late one or Mm -hmm. two times. We're all late, uh, especially me, Uh, and so. I think that I think that you know that the if you notice that the lateness is a trend and that mm-hmm. it's getting in the way of this person's success, then you want to address it and mm-hmm. give the person just an opportunity to fix the problem. There's no consequences to the conversation. Yeah, uh, there, it's just it, you know here's something that I've noticed that you could fix, and yep. so that's that's the idea. And then if it's not getting fixed, I would say the the next step is probably if if there's a performance management system in place that you 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 know you would give the person a low rating that, so that they would know that you're not just talking when you say the being late is a problem but there there's going to be there are consequences and then if it still persists then you put them on a uh, improvement plan usually that's how i would expect it to go now of course there are, there are companies that only do a performance management like performance reviews once a year and maybe something is such a big problem that they can't wait to do the low rating and official performance review first and so they'll do the performance improvement plan sooner but certainly the person should be getting a lot of feedback just development feedback before you shouldn't go straight to a pip mm-hmm. that's a failure that's a feedback fail and a PIP should not, should never be a surprise. The person should be aware that if they don't improve on this thing, that that they're going to be put on a performance improvement plan. And the performance improvement plan, I mean, people make a million mistakes with them, but usually they're either like, it's impossible to meet the requirements set forth in the performance improvement plan. So it's like this weird catch 22 thing or the performance improvement plan. Sometimes managers make a mistake and they make it too easy uh, to that. They, they, they are not clear enough. They feel bad about saying this is what the expectation is. And therefore the person passes the per- performance improvement plan, but they're still not doing well enough. The, the, the manager still wants to fire them. So that's another problem. They're either too hard or too easy. So too hard, too easy. And then there's also where this is the first time you're hearing about it is the performance improvement plan. This is a, a surprise. And I'm curious, like, do you have any times in your career where you've either yourself experienced this or you've heard stories where someone, maybe this is like the four weeks in where this, the first time someone is hearing about something is through the PIP. And then the manager says, oh, but I've been telling them about this every week and they're not hearing it. Yeah. I mean, so there are certainly times when the manager truly has not told the person and the PIP is legitimately a surprise. There are other times when the manager has told the person a bunch of times, but they didn't, it didn't sink in until they realized that they were going to be fired if they didn't fix the problem. And and that happens. Like sometimes you really tell a person a thing a bunch of times and they think it doesn't matter until they realize they're going to get fired if they don't fix it. And and that is kind of what why there's performance improvement plans because, because sometimes you need to put stuff in writing to to get through to the person. So you talked about it's either impossible to meet or it's too easy. Have you written performance improvement plans? Have you created performance I improvement have, plans? I have. What what in your experience like what is that process to get to if not a perfect pip an actually helpful and effective pip? You know, it's interesting. There was one CEO who I was coaching and I recommended to the CEO that they have HR really do a better job helping managers write performance improvement plans because they're it's not common sense. I mean, it's it's hard to do and it's hard to do well and if it's the first time you've ever done one, you need some help. Uh so if if you are a manager, if you're listening to this and you're a manager and you have to write one, ask someone who's done them before to help you. 
there's a few things you want to make sure that you get help with. One is to make sure that it is reasonable, to make sure that it's possible to pass the performance improvement plan. It's not okay if you're a manager and you haven't been giving, what, I mean, this is what happens all the time. A person has not been radically candid. So the, the manager is increasingly frustrated because they've been ruinously empathetic. They, it's like mm-hmm. the Bob story. You know, they have not said the thing. They've not said mm-hmm. the thing. And by the time they finally say the thing, they're ready to fire this person. But the person is like, this is the first time they've heard of it. And mm-hmm. then because the manager is so fed up, they don't want to give the person an opportunity to fix it. And they just want them to go right away. And so they write in a, a, a performance. It's like a straight shot from ruinous empathy to obnoxious aggression. <laughs> yeah. So you want to make sure that you're not using the performance improvement plan to force someone to quit before you have given them the, the feedback. You, you know, it, it should really be written in a way that gives a person an opportunity to fix the problem. Uh, and the fact that you are already frustrated and ready to fire them now is frankly your fault, not their fault. So, so you need to own, if if you're frustrated and HR people tell me this all the time, they're like, oh, this, I'm supporting this manager and this manager has not given this person any feedback and they've given them several good ratings. And now they're writing this sort of catch 22 performance improvement plan and the employee is really frustrated and fed up understandably so so you don't want to yeah. make that mistake that's the too hard mistake the too easy mistake is the manager who's not really been giving the feedback and they're kind of aware that the their employee is not understanding what the expectations are and so they're sort of finessing things they're like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to explain exactly what the expectations are because now the person's going to be mad. There's like the ruinously empathetic mm-hmm. performance improvement plan, which is like, oh, you know, if you can just show up 40% of the time, then you'll pass the plan. But your expectation is actually 80% of the time. So you need to make sure the performance Im- improvement plan is very clear, like ab- about what the person needs to do in order to succeed in this job. Well, what's so interesting as you're sharing that, I'm wondering, and this might be really pushing the limit here, if a manager is actually practicing radical candor, they are having these one-on-one conversations, development conversations, it's clear what this person needs to do to achieve success in their role. They're resourcing them accordingly. In an ideal world, if this was happening, would we then never need a PIP? Because it would be clear this person either was resourced to do what they needed to do, they knew what the feedback was, and then it was clear that there wasn't a fit or there was. But the the lack of clarity, the lack of practicing radical candor is what maybe even led to the PIP? Or is, is that pushing it too far? It, yes, in theory, you're right. But the reality is, even though I say... You know, radical candor gets measured at the listener's ear, not at the speaker's mouth. Sometimes the th- the speaker needs to write a performance improvement plan to make it clear. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> some sometimes there are. I mean, there are people who just don't hear what you have to say until they understand that there are consequences. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the only way to make those consequences clear is to put them on a performance improvement plan. That has happened to me where I I, like I have said the thing, I've written the thing, I feel like I've sung and danced the thing and the person (laughs) still is brushing me off. And uh, and then and then I write the performance improvement plan. They're like, oh, you mean I could get fired if I don't fix this? I'm like, yep. And then they fix it. You know, Uh, it's kind of frustrating. But that you're looking as, like you're a, you're you're dubious, well, I, I'm Amy. just I, I am really enjoying. I mean, enjoying is not the right word. The flip side of it, which goes back to the sort of development versus performance conversations, is that we will hear from folks. Oh, do I need to write up what happened in this conversation? So I might have had a radically candid conversation with you, in the spirit of development and growth, and this isn't being used to manage me. But are there times when then you actually do need to sort of 
write up what happened in the conversation and make a clear record of that? Or does that go against the, uh, this is not being part of your management profile of these conversations? Yeah, I think that if you are working with someone and you feel like you wonder when you finish the conversation, if communication happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> were we in the same yeah. conversation? Yeah. D- like, did I get through to this person? Did this person understand what I said? Mm-hmm. Even though I was as clear as I thought I possibly could be, I still have some lingering doubts about whether whether I was heard. That's a good time to to write it down. Before I get to the point of of following up with an email, as we said in our conversation, bump, 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 bump. Things are not going well if you're if you're having to write it. You, yeah, you, there's a lack of, but but often things don't go well, and so that's what you can do. I think before I try to document conversations, I will ask the other person to document. Mm. So so I'll say at the end. So just to make sure that we're on the same page, can you send me an email about what we talked about? Sometimes, and it depends on the person, but sometimes the other person would rather own that documentation. They'll feel Mm. less like they're moving towards a performance improvement plan if they're writing it up than if I write it up. Other times, the person will be more more annoyed by me asking them to do the work, so I'll just do the work. That's so interesting. How do you know that that person might be annoyed, quote unquote, for having to do the work? Have they actually told you that, or was that... It's usually just a gut feeling and maybe I'm mm-hmm. wrong, but I, I, you know, there are some people who I've worked with who, if I send them after a conversation, as we discussed in this, they'll, they'll go into kind of a tailspin like, oh, now, now I'm in trouble. I'm on a performance improvement plan. So if I know that this person, like sometimes if, if, if you're working with someone and they're extremely deferential to authority, you might. <clears throat> that's a time when I would ask them to to mm-hmm. own, own it, I ask them to write it. So, you know, just to make sure we're on the same page. Can you jot down what you're going to do next and send me an email after this? To move us in a different direction. And, and this is something that I've had a little experience with. Like sometimes you might be a manager and either you're a new manager who's coming into a team from someone who maybe wasn't as effective a manager as they could be, or you've, you're inheriting a team, you know, maybe another part of the organization. So how do you proceed so that people are in the right roles and can perform their jobs effectively before (laughs) kind of preempt the pips in terms of alignment? I mean, it's really hard to inherit a team that has had no feedback. Right. So everybody, sometimes you'll inherit a team. So I'll, I'll be precise about a couple of different ways in which the previous manager maybe wasn't a great manager. One way is that the previous manager never gave any feedback. So nobody really knows how they're doing. Or maybe the previous manager was one of those people who gave everybody great ratings and told everybody they were great all the time. Mm-hmm. And maybe there are a couple of people on that team who are actually not performing very well. And now after they've been told by the previous manager for the previous three years, oh, you know, you're doing great. Now all of a sudden there's a new manager in town and the new manager's like, actually, you need to improve this, this, and this. And the person is understandably frustrated by that situation. They thought everything was great. And now, uh, now this new manager thinks it's not so great. And uh, that is just hard. Yeah. And, and but I think that the longer the longer you wait to start giving that feedback, the worse it's going to be. You're you're going to you don't there's already you're inheriting feedback debt and you got to start clearing that out. Kim, can we do like a little role play of what you would say to me? Sure. I'm the inherited employee who's just doing my thing and you're the new sheriff in town. Sure. Do you do you know what I've been doing? Do you have an, any yeah, but I'm no sheriff. I'm just yeah. the new manager. <laughs> um, so let's assume, for the purposes of this role play, that we've had a lunch. We've gotten to know each other a mm-hmm. little bit. 
I've solicited some feedback from you. I've told you I really want you to tell me what I can oh. do or stop. You know, so, okay, so, so you're like ass- you're doing some radical candor. So already. let's assume I've already gone through some of the order of operations. Okay. I've already solicited feedback from you. I've given you some praise. I've gotten to know you a little bit. So I'm not, this is not like the first time we're sitting down. Okay. All right. So Amy, there's, there's something I've noticed about your work that I want to talk to you about today. Is that, is today a good day to have this conversation? Well, it was a fine day, but now I'm really, I'm really nervous. What, what have you noticed? <laughs> yeah. I don't want you to be nervous because the well, things- I mean, that, like, uh, that, that makes it worse. <laughs> I'm sorry. The things that I've noticed, you can fix. A hundred percent, you can fix. Whew, okay. But I'm, the, the team is responsible for, for customer support. And I've noticed that most, most people on the team uh, have a net promoter score from the customers who've, whose questions they've answered, of, you know, really high. And yours is a little bit lower. So what I want to do is sit down with you and sort of maybe listen to some of the calls that you're, that you're on so that I can give you some advice about how to improve that net promoter score. Well, why do you think you would know more about the customer? I've been working with the customers for 10 years. Well, why, why do you think your net promoter score is lower than anyone else's on the team? I mean, to be honest, like those sort of numbers don't really matter. Like people are always so happy when they talk to me and they're like, oh, I'm so glad you caught. Like there's, I really build a rapport with them. So I don't, like, this is the first I'm hearing that the net promoter score is like a meaningful metric for us. So that's, I thought I was doing something really the right way the whole time. And now I feel like there's this whole new system. Yeah, well, I, I mean, the whole organization uses Net Promoter Score, so I'm really sorry. You should have been told all along. Uh, but I, well, now I, I just feel like everything I've been doing is a waste. Well, I think that if we spend some time understanding what's going on, you can improve going forward. I mean, there, there, there is a problem. I'm sorry you didn't know about it before. You should have known about it before. But, uh, but pretending that there's not a problem is not going to solve problem. So let's let's just sit down and look at it together. I'm here with you. I'm sure that you can fix it. You've got great experience. But but we do need to move that net promoter score up. I thought that was great, Kim. You are very unruffled. <laughs> it's it's easier in a role play than it is yeah. in real life. <laughs> well we've got Brandy and Nick here. Um any questions from the observers or reflections on any feedback on my feedback? Yeah, feedback on feedback, Brandy. I think that, yeah, Kim, you're very unflappable. You don't get ruffled by the pushback. I could tell that Amy was starting to get upset, but the way you responded, I think, really helped redirect the conversation mm-hmm. toward this is a problem we can solve and I'm going to help you succeed. It felt less confrontational than it could have. Yeah, I thought I to- I think that's totally right, Brandy. I felt Kim twice you're saying I know you can fix this. Like and it felt like you actually believed that I could fix it. And so the <laughs> the thing that was in my mind was like what if this person can't fix it? Like what what if you don't actually as the manager have confidence that this person can fix it? Have you been in that situation where you didn't necessarily think the person could fix it? Yeah, I mean, and if I'm in that situation, I would have said something more along the lines of, I think you might be in the wrong job. And I'm here to help you find a, a job where you're better. But but it, unless you can move your net promoter score up, then you can't stay in this job. You know, I, I would be more clear about mm. about my pessimism. But I think in this case, I probably, it would be premature to be pessimistic. I wouldn't be prematurely pessimistic. I generally start out being optimistic. And then I notice if a person is not able or willing to fix the problem, then I, then I start talking about, let's find something else where you, where you can do a good job. And that goes back to the point you raised in the beginning where, where I said, nobody is a B player. You know, there's no such thing as someone who can't be great at their job, but, but, but there's, it happens all the time that there are jobs that a person is not well suited for. There's something even in, just in the way you answer that question where I really do feel like a non-judgmental willingness to find the right 
role for this person and to real like you really are invested in this person's success and whether customer service is your thing or something else like there's not this like well you suck at customer service and ugh, now I got to find you a new job like I just I think the reason why your radically candid criticism lands so well for me in that case is because I really do feel and you say you know we communicate cognitively emotionally you know, I really feel the commitment to what is in my best interest. Like, I, I really feel like you are invested in me. Yeah, and I think that is probably one of the most important things about being a good boss is you, at a certain point, it's time to take the company hat off, take your own hat off and put the hat of the other person on. Like, my goal here is to help this person do great work. And hopefully it's on my team, but maybe it's on somebody else's team, or maybe it's in a different, whole different um, sort of department or at a whole different company. Like, but, but like being interested in each individual who works with you is the thing that mm -hmm. makes management meaningful. And if you, if you don't care, it's going to just feel very tedious because <laughs> it's yeah. work. Yeah, I really felt it. And Nick, I know I'd asked, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but here I am putting you on the spot. Was there anything more from that role play that we haven't spoken about? I don't think so. There's a vacuum going on in the background, which so I'm not sure. If this is yeah, so I want to I, I want to apologize about my vacuum. We, we had a flood. Oh no! Oh, on in your end. house. <laughs> Oh, there's a, there's also a vacuum here. We 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 share this vacuum. See, I love how Kim is so busy wanting to take That's the blame that you're owning Nick's vacuum. Uh, well, I have a vacuum too. I had a flood, and so there's some noises. We're just having the house clean, so nothing tragic. <laughs> um, I'm I'm shocked at how nervous these role playing scenarios make me when I'm not involved at all. I listen to them, and I just I feel like I'm the one. It's like, you're going to get fired. Um, so they're very effective. And I'm always yeah. impressed at how, like Brandy said, you're unflappable with this. And it's almost odd to me to have a manager or a boss put that much effort and care uh, into my career. Um, mm -hmm. And I would absolutely love that. The only question that I, I would say that I would have about this is, how how often is this actually effective? And have you ever been surprised by uh, a person's effort or the outcome of the situation? Because we mentioned, you know, whether or not you you think somebody's actually going to be able to achieve this and whether it's worth doing. It. So how how has that played out in your experience? I I have been sometimes pleasantly surprised about uh, how someone. Once you like write down what they have to do in order to succeed, and once they're aware of what the consequences are of not succeeding, how they can rise to it. Now, it doesn't always work. Uh, the, and sometimes once you write it down, the person's like, uh, I don't want this job. <laughs> they quit. Uh, but that's also okay. Um, but it, the, the important thing, you know, what's the quote about the, the most common problem with communication is the illusion that it has happened. Like, I think a, a good performance <laughs> improvement plan can, can burst through that illusion. And, and, and that sometimes that solves the problem one way or another. Uh, other times it's, it, it feels like it just drags out the pain. So that's the, that's, I think, I think a lot of managers feel like once they have decided this person needs to go, they want to be able just to fire them. And I think that that's often not fair to the employee. And that's why performance improvement plans exist, because it's kind of like a check and balance on the manager's power. So I will, can I offer some criticism of what I did? Or I don't know if it's criticism. I think I did the right thing, but I imagine a lot of listeners who were listening to that role play winced when I told you, I'm sorry that you didn't know this before. But I think it's okay that I said that because I think I am sorry you didn't hear it before. And I, and I didn't want to say, I'm sorry your previous manager didn't do their job and was <laughs> a shitty manager. Like, but, but I am sorry you didn't already know this. You should have already known this. Um, and I'm not going to make any judgment about why you didn't know it. 
That is so interesting. I didn't have that reaction at all. I felt very authentic without, to your point, kind of throwing the other person under the bus, um, which might be some of the emotion underneath it of like, oh, I've inherited this whole situation. I was leading a workshop recently where there was, uh, and the group did a lot of customer support, and um, there was a, a woman who felt very strongly just to not say I'm sorry so often. And I think some of it was sort of this, you know, response to women needing or feeling like women need to apologize for things that weren't necessarily quote their responsibility. Um, I didn't have that reaction, but I'm curious what, what led you to think to say, I'm sorry for saying I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm, okay. I think I should have said I'm okay, sorry. Good. Let me be clear. All but right. I imagine, because uh, I've been told often, don't say, I'm never say I'm sorry. Yeah, I got, that was and, what came and, up in the session. Yeah. I'm so curious and, about that. And I think that it is true that, that as a woman, I probably apologize more often than the men who I've worked with. But I would say maybe men can apologize a little more often, not I should apologize less often. I think. I mean, I am sorry that you hadn't heard. You know, if you're sorry, yeah. there's no harm in saying it. It's also like, I'm wrong. I think I'm sorry and I'm wrong are two things that managers should say more often than they do. And very often, people are uncomfortable with that. People think that's the wrong thing to do as a leader. But I, I think those are important things to give voice to as a leader. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I want to get more specific <laughs> and measurable. Um, one of the things that we talked about was is four weeks too quickly a, a time to determine that a PIP needs to happen. And so just some of the things again in this in this SHRM piece we can put in the in the show notes that PIPs usually last 30, 60, or 90 days, depending on how long it would reasonably take to improve. So not too hard, not too easy. And using whether it's SMART goals, specific measurable objectives that are achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Do you Does that resonate with you, Kim, of what you think are the sort of meat and potatoes of, a, of an effective PIP? Yes. I think in an ideal world, before there's a PIP, a person would have gotten a performance review that indicated that there's a performance problem. And then a person would move to a PIP. Now, all of those things, I, a lot of my career was in startups, and all of those things could happen over the course of a month at a startup, whereas at a bigger company, things usually mm -hmm. don't happen quite so fast. So I don't want to say four weeks is absolutely ridiculous as a hard and fast rule, but in, in, in the case, I, I went back and forth with this listener, and indeed, it was a ridiculous situation. <laughs> But, but I th the key thing is you need to talk to the person before you put them on a performance. You, you want to get on the same page sort of at a basic human level before you move to a formalized performance improvement plan. Did you ever have the emotional part of the person being on the PIP? Like how might that have impacted your relationship with this person both sort of before, during, and after the PIP? Once you've moved to a PIP, the relationship usually becomes much more awkward and tense. Yeah. It's not a comfortable thing. But just because it's not comfortable doesn't mean it's wrong. It's better than not putting the person on a PIP and just firing them willy-nilly, you know? This kind of communication is really hard, and it's really uncomfortable. And... You know, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. I do not have emotional Novocaine <laughs> to offer. Uh, but what I do have is a promise that it's worth the pain to go through this and to go through it correctly. Because, you know, firing someone, you really disrupt their life. And it's the worst part of being a manager. And if you do it well and reasonably and fairly, um, then you might even have a person later come and thank you, say, you know, you really helped me get to a better place. And if you do it badly and you, you can have someone coming up to you later saying that you left them with emotional scars and trauma and, and you screwed up their life. And 
if you become a manager, you want to do, you know, more <laughs> helping and less trauma. I, I don't think that's too high a bar. I, 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 I couldn't agree more. Jason, we often will say, you know, first do no harm. Yes. Uh, and, and, and certainly <laughs> do no trauma. Yeah, absolutely. Kim, last question for you on this. I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of someone who is suddenly surprised uh, by a PIP. Um, it, it seems to come out of the blue. There was no performance review highlighting the issues. This does feel to you like it's the first time you're hearing it. What should you say to your, to your boss? So I think before you say anything to your boss, you should locate the exit nearest you. <laughs> um, and so what I mean by that is figure out what other jobs are available to you, or do you have enough, have enough savings to be able to live for six months if you don't have a job? Or is there someone's couch you can, like, what are you going to do if you get fired? Because I think that once you know what your exit options are, it's much easier to communicate more clearly with your boss. So if you know it is trivially easy for you to go get another job and you really feel like your boss was unreasonable in, in this performance improvement plan, by all means, go tell your boss that you, th you, know, you think it's unreasonable and why. Uh, in 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 very in in very clear terms, um, but I think before you charge in and say to your boss, "Hey, you're being unreasonable here," you want to like take a step back and say, "What happened? There's been a massive miscommunication here. I, I thought everything was fine, and clearly it's not fine." And really do just a little bit of soul searching and and try to figure out. Could I have seen this coming? Did I do something wrong? And if you really feel like you didn't do anything wrong, then go in and say that by all means. If you do think uh, that you could have done some stuff better, like go in and own that. Um, but, but, you know, so take a beat and ask yourself some questions, look yourself in the mirror. And then uh, if you're okay winding up getting fired, then I would be very radically candid. Would you recommend, again, each situation has its own nuances and context, but for this this one where so it's someone is really caught off guard, it's the first they're hearing about it, would you recommend that person, if there is an HR team to, prior to going to the boss, reach out to the HR team or someone else in the organization for support? Uh, I think it's always good to build solidarity, to look for someone to talk to. Uh, I think that HR is often part of the solution here, but sometimes in some organizations, HR is part of the problem. So make sure that you have some understanding of whether you can trust the HR team where you're working. Uh, I would not assume you can or cannot. Uh, I think you want to really understand. And it also depends on your relationship with your boss. If you, if you had or thought you had a reasonable mm -hmm. relationship with this person and can communicate with them, I think it's always better to go directly rather than yeah. to get someone else involved. But there, there may be times when your boss is, um, is unreasonable or just not very good at their job, and you, you do need uh, to involve HR. Well, on that note, shall we move on to our tips? Let's do it. Now it's time for our Radical Candor Checklist, tips you can use to start putting Radical Candor into practice. Tip number one. Balance the intrinsic desire to improve and grow and the extrinsic desire for rewards like bonuses, equity, promotion. That balance, that understanding, not only that balance, but also the difference between development and performance management is one of the most challenging things about being a manager. Performance management is different than development conversations, and yet they are very often conflated. If a company is actively committed to performance development or just to development conversations, there shouldn't be any surprises when performance review time rolls around or a PIP happens. A PIP should never be the first time anyone gets feedback about their underperformance. Tip number two, if you're a manager and it's your first time writing a PIP, 
Get some help. Ask someone, whether it's from HR, the people team, or someone who has written one before to help you. This is a different form of communication, and it's important to make sure that the metrics for success you're using, we're not in that Goldilocks, neither too easy uh, nor unattainable. The PIP should be written in a way that gives this person an opportunity to fix the problem in a time-bound and specific way. Tip number three, your job as a manager is to help people do great work. The problem might be that the person is in the wrong job and their skills could be better used in a different role. This means being interested in each individual who works for you as a human being. This relationship is the true gift of being a manager. Well, before we close, I would be remiss if I did not reflect a little bit on the phrase PIP, because in our Feedback Loop comedy series, we had one of the employees in that series was put on a PIP. If you want to listen to Gladys Knight and the Pips, I think we're going to have to put a song in the show notes. But in the meantime, additional Radical Candor resources. That's RadicalCandor.com slash resources. Brandy, can you say that again? What was the line about Pips in the feedback loop? The person who was put on the Pips, the two managers were talking about him and they said, he's had more Pips than Gladys Knight. Thank you for bringing us back to some of the, the comedy. And one last thought that just <laughs> occurred to me. My least favorite acronym for a PIP is called a PEP. That is just obnoxious. That is obnoxious, manipulative insincerity. It's not peppy to get a PIP. It's hard. So what does the pretend. E stand for? Excellence or some bullshit. I don't know. <laughs> so please do not call it a, a PEP. It's a PIP. It's a PIP. Okay. Uh, On that note, bye for now. Stay peppy. (laughs) Stay peppy. Stay peppy. Peppy Longstocking. Thanks for joining us. Our podcast features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff, is produced by our director of content, Brandy Neal, and hosted by me, Amy Sandler. Music is by Cliff Goldmacher. Go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Candor and find us online at RadicalCandor.com.